Hello and welcome to Conquer the Beast. This is where we're gonna be taking a look at the PMP exam and I'll be sharing with you tips, tricks, and ideas about how other students conquered the exam, how I conquered the exam. But I've heard through the grapevine, the landscape has changed. A lot of students are fretting that the PMBOK Guide sixth edition doesn't map to the content outline and they've not got a firm idea of what to do. I wanted to help you by giving you this gift. Now, around episode four or five, I will be telling you why I'm giving you this gift. But for now, enjoy the gift. And this gift is to help get you out of the rubble. Now, very simply put, if you are taking this exam called the PMP exam, you cannot rely on experience alone. You could rely on experience to get counted as part of those who can take the exam. You're eligible, right? But that's not enough. You need to understand project management, Agile, predictive hybrid from PMI's lens. And that means you need to have a building block. And one of the building blocks starts on page 25 of this book. Another building block is hidden in this book. You know what it is? It's really more of the scrum skeleton. So I need you to be aware of two frameworks. This framework and the other framework implicitly shown here but I'll be showing it to you explicitly. Now, I'm gonna be showing you two big pieces you need to build everything else on for your sanity and peace of mind. Let's go there really quickly. So once again, welcome to Conquer the Beast. The first one I want you to be aware of is the Scrum Overview. Now you've seen this from a lot of sources and a lot of uh, variations, variety of this exists. And I believe Mountain Goat put this out and. A lot of people have modified, but it's a really great starting point for you to build your understanding of Agile on. And as you can see, we've got five ceremonies, three roles, three artifacts. You need to know what exactly this is all about, all right? Search through the videos on our channel and you'll find us blowing this out in more detail, but you do need to have a framework to build an understanding of Agile on. Once you understand the manifesto, the values, the principles, it's time to start putting those into a practical framework, such as Scrum. It is going to help you. It's gonna help you understand what an iteration is, uh, of course, what sprints are, because we call iteration sprints in the world of Scrum, PSI, MVP, uh, retrospectives, everything is gonna become clearer to you. The long and short of this story is the way we tackle needs in the world of Scrum is different. We got business needs, they get flowed into the product backlog. The product backlog is a list of all the things a customer wants. We need to plan what we're gonna do in each sprint. So we have sprint planning. And sprint planning helps us to zero in on what we're doing for each iteration. And then you build out your sprint backlog. Sprint backlog is gonna be worked on all throughout the sprint, one to three weeks. The Agile uh, practice guide talks about it being two weeks, sweet spot, typically two weeks, but a lot of companies use anywhere from one to six weeks. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule, but just know that the industry average is about two weeks. We have the daily scrum, which is a daily standup where we talk about impediments, problems, blockers, but we talk about what we've done to advance the sprint goal previously, what we're gonna to do to advance the sprint goal today, and whatever impediments. We also have backlog refinement that happens. It's not a formal ceremony, but it should be happening at some points within the sprint. We have a sprint review where the customer takes a look at the PSI, the potentially shippable increment, and they comment, demo it. And we have a sprint retrospective ceremony where lessons learned are gathered within the team. It's a closed door meeting, if you will, uh, except you're invited, you really shouldn't be in there. We say Agile Vegas, whatever happens in the Agile retrospective, the sprint retrospective, it stays there. And ultimately, we go back immediately and start off the next sprint, and that's how it works. Now, a lot of what is talked about in Agile, you need this high-level understanding to build on, because there are many Agile tenets and concepts that this will help you with. The next thing I want you to be aware of is page 25 in the PMBOK guide, sixth edition. Now, people look at this and say, oh, it's so difficult. How am I gonna master this? It is very, very simple to master. And I wanna show you how you can master this. 
once you have left initiating, which includes the development of the charter and the identification of stakeholders, which is basic, no need to cram that, developing a charter that authorizes the project and identifying stakeholders that could be affected by the project or that can affect the project. Those are the first two things that happen within the initiating process group. But remember, we also have knowledge areas. I saw six chipmunks quietly roasting coffee, reading poetry stories. Mnemonics. One of the ways you can master this is mnemonics. And the mnemonic is only going to help you have a framework to build everything else on. To be perfectly honest with you, if you want to be a great trainer of your company, of your team, you need to have these at your fingertips because it helps you put structure around what you already know and it helps you to explain it to them. So you know what I recommend? I want to recommend that you use mnemonics. Mnemonics are going to help you. I'm going to show you a mnemonic, a mnemonic sheet, and I hope you take a screenshot of it and you just use it to build that at your fingertips type feel for this exam. So let me show you this right now. Take a screenshot. These are my ridiculous mnemonics for the PMP exam. You can see that first one. David dances delightfully most Mondays playing chords. Now that will give you a visual. These are some of the things you need to apply yourself to kind of just master it. And once you have those 49 processes at your fingertips, it makes more integrative sense. So remember I said in the very beginning, develop project charter, identify stakeholders. Those are pretty easy. But moving into planning, take a look at how you can get this down. Every knowledge area has a plan, name of the knowledge area management process for the most part. And that's the first process in planning. You see that? Plan, name of the knowledge area management. Plan, name of the knowledge area management. See that? Plan scope, plan schedule, plan costs. You see that? Plan quality management, plan resource management, plan communications management, plan risk management. So if you've got these mastered with my chipmunk mnemonic, I saw six chipmunks quietly roasting coffee, reading poetry stories. You've got the top mastered with I prefer eating mangoes chilled. Just remember plan X management, plan procurement management, plan stakeholder well, this is engagement, so it's a little trick going on there. But just remember, stakeholders, you don't manage them, you engage them. Just remember that. It'll help you. Now, moving on to monitoring and controlling, this is monitor and control, project work. So the words you're going to find in this column of monitoring and controlling are either monitor or control for the most part. There are some exceptions. Now, let's take a look. Control, name of the knowledge area. Control, name of the knowledge area. You see that? Control, name of the knowledge area. Scope, control, quality, control, resources. You see that? So those first five, you saw control, scope, control, schedule. You see that? But moving down into communications, we use the word monitor because people are involved. We don't control people's communications. We monitor. Monitor risks is another one where we use a softer word as monitor because you can't control the unknown. It would be nice, but you can't. Control goes back in procurement. You see that? And monitor, because these are people. We use a softer term, monitor, stakeholder. Again, it's engagement. See that? So taking a look at what I've shown you, you almost have half of the table mastered. Now let's go into executing. Taking a look in executing, you got manage something, manage something. You see that? So manage project knowledge, manage name of the knowledge area. See that quality, manage team, manage name of the knowledge area. You see that? Manage name of the knowledge area engagement. Boom, you're almost half done, my friends. So this is not as hard. This is not as laborious. And I really want to encourage you to get these down, spend a day taking a look at my mnemonic sheet, and this is going to help you put these knowledge area terms together so that you have them at your fingertips and you feel a lot more comfortable. Okay? 
moving on. This is all well and good, but you also need a recipe to be able to digest the logic of what is happening. Taking a look at the matrix is good, but you got to understand what is happening in the matrix. And you know how you do that? You do that by breaking down the matrix into the PMBOK guide mainline. And this mainline shows you a web of interactions that is at the heart of the PMBOK guide. The major goal is to get your deliverable that adds value to the customer, that gives them benefits, that adds value. And the way to do that is by directing and managing project work, which is going to give you deliverables those deliverables get checked in control quality. And ultimately, you're going to get a verified deliverable that goes to validate scope. The customer will check it and they'll get to the point where they accept the deliverable because it's what they asked for. And out of that accepted deliverable going to close project or phase, you're going to end up getting a final transition. And there you have it. The customer is happy and can use what you gave them. Now, I talk about this main line in another video that was just put out early February. I want you to go to the channel, the Prazion channel, and check it out. But ultimately, this main line shows you 20% of the processes from the big map I showed you on page 25, and it helps you understand what exactly is happening. Okay, and you should draw out this main line, go for the journey. It is going to help you unravel what exactly is happening here. And then when you take a look at the Agile Practice Guide and you're trying to understand the world of Agile after reading the manifesto, you understand the values and the principles, then you can take a look at this page and you can relate the principles to an actual practice. Take a look at this. The first one on page nine, it says, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. How does that happen? Through this framework. What do you think you're delivering? This, the potentially shippable increment, but it's continuous because as soon as you get done delivering this, you are going back to start the next sprint. You get what I'm saying? If you take a look at the second one, welcome changing requirements, even late in development. The product backlog is not exempt from change. All it needs is whoever is asking for the change to negotiate, to talk to the product owner. And the product owner brings a team along for the ride. And if it's change for the customer's competitive advantage, the product owner sees that and the change is welcome. Number three, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Now that's two weeks to eight weeks. Well, very recently that has changed. And you can see my buddy who put this together, Roy, he said one to three weeks. And we know that in the current scrum guide, it says four weeks or less, but the sweet spot is two weeks. So when you read this principle, you see it in the scrum framework easily. The next one says business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Now, we're not just talking about the daily scrum, but we're talking about all throughout the sprint. And this is where the team, a self-organizing team, knows how to plug and play with the business. Number five, build projects around motivated individuals. The idea is that this is a self-organizing team. It says, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Number six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation as much as possible. And I know during the pandemic, the cameras need to come on, but it's still sort of face-to-face. -face. That's how you get the best 
Professor Emeritus Albert Moravian in coining the 55387 illustrates that communication is predominantly not words. Majority of the message is conveyed through tone of voice, 38%, and body language, a massive 55%. Number seven, working software is the primary measure of progress. And that is why we have our sprint review. And we do things in iteration such that if we realize this is not adding value to the customer, again, the term MVP, minimum viable product, we deliver the minimum viable product and we glean feedback to understand we're not delivering what is needed. We make changes right there in the backlog as needed with the approval of the product owner. Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Number 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. In other words, we don't want to do busy work. We want to do the minimum amount of work needed to satisfy the customer. Remember, this is from the world of lean. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Again, a self-organizing team. And when we say team, the scrum team, that is your scrum team. All of those are your scrum team. Finally, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. What are we talking about? The retrospective. Okay. So my friends, over the past number of minutes, we've been having an introduction, just a tiny little introduction to a much wider course with various pieces. But for those of you who are immediately aware that you need to work towards your PMP exam success using additional tools and content, I want you to go on down to our website. It's called praiseon.com, P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com. And when you get to praiseon.com, you'll be able to check out the various options that we have for training. But don't forget, you need to watch the additional modules from this course, okay? So let's go on down to the website, www.praiseon.com. For those of you that immediately know that you've not been doing enough. And here it is. And there you can see we've got training for those studying for the PMP, those who are already PMPs. And you can get audio aids, study aids, and a lot more if you click on view more products. So thank you very much for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you in all the other episodes. All the very best. Bye for now.